Testing, one, one, two. How are you? I hope you can hear me. The world of Instagram. So today we're going to be chatting with Richard Hills. There he is. Hey dude. I'm going to add you into the mix. Yes, we did it. <laughs> we did it. Yeah, we did it, man. We did it. Um, if if you've just joined us um, a couple of moments ago, Richard and I were trying to work out uh, another application to record <laughs> a conversation. We couldn't figure out the audio. We're clearly not audio and techno junkies, but that's okay. We decided to um, sort of uh, in South Africa, it's called a, a boot like a plan in New Zealand. It's uh, basically making a plan. And so we made yeah. a plan. And so here we are in, <laughs> in Instagram. Richard, how the hell are you, man? What's going on? Yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, well, as good as you can be under sort of the bizarre um, <laughs> state we're all in. But yeah, just really busy, but definitely ready to uh, see family, friends, get back mm. to a bit of normality. Um, obviously really privileged to have uh, work and everything at the moment. Uh, so, but especially because it's so hard for everyone else out there right now. Yeah. And look, we, we'll, we'll get into um, what I really wanted to speak to you about today, which is how I feel like, and I think a lot of people can attest to this is how you, in my opinion, have, if you want to call it success, successfully navigated and shared uh, what I call like a voice of reason in what, and otherwise it's like an unreasonable <laughs> state. But, but before we get there, before we get there, I, I wanted to, because um, we've seen formal sort of, you know, images of you and, you know, like whenever someone thinks of a council or the government, it's all like hoity-toity and, and uh, sort of pomp and circumstance and ceremony and all that stuff. But um, it wasn't all that for you and it's not all that for you. you you're actually a real person who, who, who does, you know, normal things. And so I wanted to just give you an opportunity to fill us in with a backstory. So who is Richard Hills and how did he get to where he is? And go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's a long question. Um, I, I guess working backwards, I didn't prepare to uh, be a counsellor. I wasn't um, preparing to stand as a counsellor, but I was already a local board member. Uh, and uh, George Wood, who was the current counsellor, had been around for a long time, decided to um, not stand after quite some time, but he did it quite last minute. So then I decided, uh, after a lot of pushing and prodding from people, um, was to stand for council pretty last minute in 2016. And um, so then, but I didn't think I was gonna win and everyone was sort of like, oh, it's nice of you to try. Um, sort of thing, um, but then I. <laughs> so I'm not. I'm not laughing at you because 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 I thought I mean I was on the shore at that stage. I'd moved from south and I, I'd seen your campaign, and I, I thought it was a slam dunk, in my opinion. Um, so I'm glad someone nudged you and prodded you. Well done. Yeah, I mean I'd been on the local board and I was working as a youth worker at the time. Um, with uh, right across Auckland. So I was passionate about those roles, but it was really, um, I guess the council role that um, I thought I could do, but I, I thought maybe being a, a young uh, gay lefty on the shore might have its limitations, but uh, it actually worked out um, all right, which was good. Uh, I only just scraped in by about 120 votes um, last time, but this time in 2019, I increased my majority by quite a lot. So that was quite, Good to know I've been going on the right track the last three years. Um, Absolutely. And I think there was some really good press that came through the New Zealand Herald at that stage as well. Um, yeah, definitely singing your praises and rightly so. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be biased. Sorry <laughs> for anyone who, who thinks I'm going to be neutral, but I'm not. So, so thank you for what you do and for, for, um, for jumping in. But who? But before that, like, 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 what did you study? Where are you from? Are you a North Shorean? You know, all of that, all of that good stuff. 
yeah, definitely grew up in Glenfield, have lived in Glenfield my whole life. Um, I studied communications at AUT, so I wanted to get into radio or television, I thought, um, and did that straight up from school, uh, went to Glenfield College, then yeah, went to AUT to do um, communications, and yeah, just ended up getting more involved in the voluntary and community sector, um, which kind of felt like more my, my gig than the kind of, um, well, I say the competitiveness of um, the media space, but I guess politics is one of the most competitive. Uh, oh, yeah. In the end, I, anyway. I, th I think that communications thing, it, it definitely shows in how you um, communicate. Uh, I, I often am arrested in a good way by each of the posts that you put up because you can see that it's thoughtful. You know, it's not just um, uh, willy-nilly, if I can use that as a turn of phrase. So uh, it's definitely held you in good stead. And in my humble opinion, from a sort of a, a branding side, um, I think uh, we can learn a lot from how you have applied yourself, especially during this time. Um, what do you think of that statement or that comment? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, the main thing I want to do is obviously do the right thing for my community, but also with um, the way council is and can seem quite removed from most people. Um, what I've tried to do is at least try and make the what we do at council and community and general um, current events is try and make them accessible to the average person who's not that interested in reading our 200 page agendas or get into bylaws or whatever it is. If I could try and uh, kind of bring my personality into the conversation, but also um, just put things in a normal in a normal way that people will understand. Um, that's pretty key uh, to me. Well, dude, I honestly, like I think you are doing a, like a stellar job. Uh, you also carry some, and I don't know if I want to call it accolades, um, but let's call it firsts, right? So, um, and you're quite open about this, but you, know, you were the first gay, openly gay um, counsellor, uh, as well as the youngest. So firsts, right? So those are both firsts. How, how have you yeah. navigated, <laughs> um, I guess, the playing field, given that, let's call it a double whammy, Right. Um, so on the one hand, people are like, oh, he doesn't have you know, age on his side. He doesn't have experience. How do I believe him? On the other hand, it's um, there's a whole lot of stuff that's sort of attached to that word uh, gay that, that un unfortunately people view the world through or not. Unfortunately, it's just it just is um, and could be seen as a, a inhibitor. So effectively, you've got two hurdles to surmount. How, how do you cope and how do you navigate that um, to be able to then still deliver? Uh, yeah, I guess um, any type of diversity in decision-making is a good thing. Um, I believe the more voices around a table um, as possible, obviously I'm not super diverse. Um, being gay is one thing, being young is another, but you know, we need more um, Pacifica, Maori, people with disabilities, all sorts around the council table, which we, at the moment are, are lacking. But I guess mm. just being honest about those traits can be seen as a negative thing, but I've always tried to use them as a um, positive or get into spaces where uh, maybe other counselors hadn't been before. Um, the I remember the headline when I first got elected, it was that, or Newstalk ZB or someone called me and said, how does it feel being the the only gay counselor or the first gay counselor like and i just hadn't even really thought of that as a um i think think about a title and, yeah, yeah yeah and so i was like i think i'll make the same decisions as anyone else um but you know like it is also quite fun i get to lead a whole lot of the pride stuff i get in you know it's you're just in communities that um otherwise would be left alone or untouched yeah maybe yeah so i get mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Maybe it's helped with empathy for others or understanding others, but yeah, it doesn't really make a difference. I guess being younger, which is slowly slipping away, um, helps as well. <laughs> Shush. Shush. But, um, how, young, how young are you at the moment? 33 now. So um, Spring chicken, man. Anyone yeah. watching this who's older than that will absolutely agree with me. Spring chicken. <laughs> you, you've, uh, you've got definitely um, 
so much more to give and I'm so grateful that you did get involved because on the youth thing, which I think you're going to touch on a bit more now, um, and we had a private sort of messenger conversation when, when elections were happening probably last year sometime, I can't remember, um, or local elections, I can't remember what it was, but um, how important is it to you that the youth, and I mean young people in this particular case, actually get involved in the conversation because I feel like it's something that our politics is for older people, you know, um, or community interests. That's what like my mom and dad do, but like we're becoming those people, you know, I've got <laughs> yeah. two kids and I, I'm, I'm still of that mindset of like, oh, you know, someone old and gray and no offense to anyone who is old and gray. I hope to be old and gray sometime soon as well um, and fit in old and gray, but like, it's always something that's um, sort of not under rug swept, but kept at the gate. You know, this whole idea. Um, how important is it to you that the youth engage more in, in meaningful discussions about what communities can and ought to look like? Yeah, I mean, the if you get down to even the nuance of voting, um, it's just young people, including anyone under 40, is just not um, voting huge. Yeah. And local government especially, very, very low numbers. Um, so it basically means people in their over 65s which their, their voters equal um, to everyone else's, but those people voting in large numbers, sort of 95% or 100% in some cases, in those demographics, they are making the decisions on behalf of everyone, which they may be the right or the um, fine decisions, but you get the louder voices. Uh, most of the meetings or the people who turn up to council meetings, the emails I get, they're largely from the older community. They're valid. Um, points and concerns but the problem is you get a warped view of maybe planning for the whole community the future uh, maybe always a focus um, might not be on what we need to do for 30 years away so most of the decisions we make today are sort of like 10 20 30 years and that's when kids of today are getting into the workforce or young people at um, college or university are thinking do I stay in Auckland do I move overseas do I buy a house um, all of the decisions around our local community from a local government's perspective affects everyone, whether you, the moment you wake up in the morning, the water coming out of your tap, we're in a drought at the moment. Yeah. You've got, um, yeah. whether you get on a bus or you can get safely to work on a cycleway or whether the roads are clogged, um, then everything to your events or the local parks. So you're kind of surrounded by decisions being made by people that are mostly um, a little bit older in our community without that diversity of voice. So it is about getting younger people involved in every part of um, our decision-making process. So Richard, then the question maybe is, how do we make politics cool again? <laughs> I have no, no idea. Like a... <laughs> I've been trying to, I've been trying to, trying to do that. And I guess that's why I make, try and make my, the way I, deal with the public or um, interact through social media as personal as possible. You know, people say, oh, do you have a private, pa I get confused with your private page and your public page, but basically like I'm kind of on the, I'm on the record with everything. Everyone knows everything about me if they follow anything of any of my social media. Um, but I kind of like hope to sneak in the, the kind of, boring messages of council into like normal life um, stuff. If you make it a little bit funny, personal, then maybe people are picking up the other, the other more important messages. And I guess I try and, people would say dumb it down, but it's not about dumbing it down. It's just about kind of words and constructs that people can understand. People are just busy. People don't really care. Absolutely. A lot of people, yeah. people just yeah. are like, you're the councillor, go do it. And other people, can be really aggressive. <laughs> so I guess there's a limit of um, how much crack, feedback is crack good. Crack that whip, crack yeah. that whip, go do the work. Um, I, cause I, 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 I wanna know if you apply like a certain formula to the communication because I, I'm certainly more engaged in the, not, let, I don't wanna call it politics, but community matters. Let's talk, let, let's say that, let's, let's put it into that community matters because of the voice that you bring. Like I'm interested in what you have to say. And I think um, through the engagement that I see on your page, whether personal or, or, or public, uh, at least on the Facebook, um, 
the numbers are huge. You know, people people value what you have to say. Look, there's the odd homophobic uh, comment which you so <laughs> aptly shared the other day, to which I responded uh, unbelievably with like in shock and awe. But um, I'm sure that's maybe a small percentage. But I think for the most part, it's certainly um, incredibly high engagement, which I think is testament to how you approach sharing the knowledge. Is there a formula that you use? and that perhaps other counselors, or at least your, your um, contemporaries use within your space, um, as set out as an example, you know, is, is, have you had that feedback? Can you comment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've tried, sometimes, it's different everywhere. Like Instagram's different than Facebook. Facebook's different to um, Twitter and talking directly to the media. Like I had an interview with BFM this morning, it's completely different. So it's kind of knowing um, you can't replicate the, the same thing everywhere. Um, yeah. Twitter, I'm very much more conversational, maybe more jokey. You're trying to get like um, a reaction. Maybe I'm a little more political on Twitter than Facebook. <laughs> on Facebook, well, it is you've the got political a... platform, right? Twitter. It's <laughs> yeah. like if you want to get political, that's where you go. <laughs> and you often get like, I have to be careful. Sometimes my tweets out of nowhere end up in the you know media and stuff. So you just have to be careful about like exactly. I, I would never. I, I don't think I swear on Twitter and, and things, you know, don't want to upset my, my grandma. Um, but, the, For sure. yeah. but the Facebook, I try, I think I was talking about this with someone yesterday. I either try and be positive or like moderately disappointed rather than like angry. <laughs> moderately disappointed. <laughs> yeah. That is, yeah, yeah. So there is an absolute formula that you, you apply when engaging these platforms and these audiences. Yeah. I mean, how do you, how, how do you view Instagram? So we're on live at the moment. It's like, what, what is your play, your playbook for Instagram? I would, it's hard because most people come to Instagram for visual um, things and not a lot of people will read um, what you've got. And you've got to be careful too that it's always engaging in it. Like sometimes I'll be sneaky and put like a, a graph up of, I don't know, the water, yeah. the water levels or something. <laughs> If you can kind of sneak every now and then something in that's a little more like um, council related uh, or you can tell a good story through an image, then that's good. But you have to be careful. Sometimes I do get a little bit lazy and might try and replicate the Facebook post with the Instagram, but I, you just don't get the same um, traffic, I guess, on Instagram. So it's kind of trying to engage people differently um, that way without without overplaying your hand so then people unfollow you and be like, I want to, I just want to hear for like great pictures of scenery and yeah, um, yeah. my, and my eggs Benedict. And I don't want to be bothered with, I don't want to be bothered with council. <laughs> but so, so if you can play up those kind of like classic Instagram kind of themes, but also like chuck in a few positive messages or council messages, then that'll help. Cause a lot of people um, sort of my demographic or younger um, are definitely leaving Facebook in their drive. So it's like, how do you still get those messages across to TikTok. people that might, might, yeah, TikTok. <laughs> Dance out a graph or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talking about the race. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's totally doable and I think you're the guy to do it. So um, I'll definitely <laughs> follow you. Are, are you on TikTok? Do you want to share if you're on TikTok? Are you? Uh, no, I, I did join, I haven't done any videos, but definitely during lockdown, it's been a good um, place to just sit and, yeah, yeah. sit and scroll and see what everyone's doing in their, their homes. It's, am, it's, it's amazing. That platform is, is incredible. Um, and like the, the amount of talent that's out there. I mean, like I've, I've done a couple of videos on them and the one video was like a dance to the weekends um, blinded by the light or blinding light. Yeah. Or <laughs> Great track, by the way. Um, that's a track I could definitely have on repeat. And so Pippa and I um, literally spent the whole day trying to figure out this 15 second sequence. <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah, I'll be good because I mean, I come from a family of dancers. So um, my brother's a dancer. Um, he is gay as well. And so like, I know about the world that, that, that you're in, although not intimately, but I know of it and because it's in the family. Uh, and also my sister's a dancer as well. And so I thought, oh, it's in the blood, you know, I, I can do this. Man, it was hard. Like just moving the <laughs> feet, I was just like, okay, like this is difficult. Anyway, but we got it up there. And um, it, it made me realize that there, there are so many talented people out there, you know, and I, yeah. I think 
during this time, uh, during this, let's call it a massive pause in, in, in how we are being in the world, I think it's allowed that talent to surface. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely in a different way, like to, to what you'd normally see. I guess people are being creative. Um, the art sector and dance and events are, are going to be really hard hit um, through this and have already been. So I think it's people trying to quickly figure out how they pivot what they normally um, would do, maybe for income, but also for enjoyment, um, how they can do that. Also, people have <laughs> become amateur um, dancers, performers, uh, getting videos right across the world. Um, also trying to, I guess, bring some positivity to what is a really hard situation for a lot of people. So mm. I am not a talented dancer, singer. Um, so I haven't gone out of my way to try and learn anything uh, during lockdown. Um, but you could be the first amateur dancer counselor. Now there's yeah. something to strive for. <laughs> I just don't want to push. <laughs> I'm just not sure I should push the barrow too far. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm not now, sure anyone wants to see that. Just to just to double double back to obviously the seriousness of where we're at and, and what's going on. What what do you see as we move through the various levels? Uh, are the biggest concerns? Um, coming out of the community that come across your desk if you were to have like a top three what are they yeah i mean i think everyone is pretty um positive and about the fact that we've seemed to have um bit beat the virus um so far as a as a country like feeling when you look across and i talk to friends overseas they're just like feeling like the health and economic impacts are sort of overwhelming and won't won't be stopped anytime soon so i think the biggest opportunity is because we are in such a great place compared to most of the world or a lot of the world um we need to quickly jump in on how we um bring investment here how we can get things going quickly um it's all going to be about jobs but also not forgetting about the environment so um how we balance those two things you know climate change and protecting our environment water quality everything hasn't suddenly gone because we're um, in this situation so it's how we um, don't forget about the environment while we're rebuilding the economy um, is a big one for me so um, but also the the transport system in the short term so we've rolled out a whole lot of cycleways and protected walkways and everything while people are social distancing and a whole lot of kids and um adults and everyone are, are, are maybe trying riding around or walking around their neighborhoods more than ever before, which is awesome. But it's like, how do we make sure we keep that up? Um, yeah. So it's yeah. quickly, quickly being nimble with our changes and maybe not um, taking as long as council normally does to get stuff done. If, if it's good and if it's safe um, and people want to, you know, do these cool things, then we should try and be an enabler for that instead of maybe getting in the way. Um, yeah, or letting, I guess, um, and dare I say this, or I guess I can say this, letting red tape determine how something rolls out. Um, yeah. You touched on something that... Uh, Last year. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm, I, I just need to plug myself in. Battery's low. Um, uh, do you want to wax lyrical quickly about your portfolio as regards climate change and what what we can all see coming out of that yeah so i'm the chair of the environment and climate change committee now so one of the the four um one of the chairs of the four major committees for council um committees yeah. of the whole so that's pretty massive but um so pre-covid we're heading in a really good direction i got unanimous support for our um the draft of our climate change plan and also um all councillors and the mayor supported halving our emissions by 2030, which is pretty massive. Um, also, we've got a huge amount of work in the environment, water quality space, um, you know, right across Auckland, which is great. But I guess COVID's put a bit of a halt on that. We are losing, as a council, uh, could be up to $600 million this year due to reduced revenues, um, yeah. you know, across every part of council we're losing money. So... I'm trying to hope that we can balance out some of those uh, savings or cuts we're going to have to make um, while also keeping those environmental projects um, 
you know, it might, it might be sort of short term things like reducing our car fleet and, um, you know, changing out our boilers and our pools from gas to electric and um, things like that. But we may, it may take longer for things like electric buses and things now because they're so much more expensive and the access mm. to the um, import sector and things might be a bit more complicated. So there is a lot we can be doing, but it's just making sure we prioritize the money we have left over, I guess, yeah. at this stage. Now, as, as an offshoot from that, and obviously kudos to you for, for keeping all of those elements in mind. What, how, how, I guess, scary, if I could use that as a, as a, as a word, is the water shortage that we're currently facing um, at the moment in your mind? Yeah, I guess the balance is um, trying not to make it scary because for one thing, we're not going to run out of water, um, but we cannot access the emergency uh, take from the Waikato River unless we prove that we're saving water um, at the okay. same time. So at the moment, um, the only way we can put restrictions on is when we dip below 50% of our, the dam basically 50% empty or full, whichever way you look at it. Um, so, but we're also taking about 150 million liters a day from the Waikato River. Okay. Um, the problem is we're, we are, we, our dams are at record lows. We've got the, maybe a one in 100 year drought at happening, but we're also using more water than ever. So we're, mm. we're, we're well above normal um, levels of water use, probably because it's so dry, people are watering their gardens more maybe um, using more well, water. People are at home, people are at home, right? So generally consumption increases when people are sort of locked up, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, although we have seen a balance between the, uh, the fact that people aren't at their workplaces. So there has been a drop in the business sector, but an increase in households. Um, yeah. But I guess all we're asking as far as a 5% saving. So um, from the 16th of May, um, the use of water buses and outdoor hoses is completely banned. Um, mm -hmm. And water care don't want to be finding people, but if if there is repeated um, flouting of the rules, they do have that ability. Um, and we're also asking people to try and keep to four minute showers, only use the washing machines when they're completely full, um, fixing leaks if there's leaks, um, things like that. So it's concerning long term for climate change. We're already looking at the issues um, across Auckland. But at the moment, this is, you know, yeah. January and February, we had 10% of our normal rainfall. Um, and this year so far, we've had about 30% of our normal rainfall. Um, so it is really concerning. If we didn't have quite the... Interesting because, um, uh, yeah. uh, no, carry on, Rich, carry on. Sorry, someone uh, tried to call me. <laughs> <laughs> As they should try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess what I wanted to say was, um, originally South African, I looked with horror and shock when Cape Town had announced, you know, it was one of the first world cities in the world to have a severe drought. And that wasn't too long ago. I think it could have been two years ago. Um, yeah. And, you know, seeing something similar at least in the early stages potentially play out here literally on the other side of the world um does say something you know i don't know if it talks to infrastructure or the fact that we're not keeping up with growth um and sort of coupled with you know what's happening from a climate perspective um yeah uh i i don't know if if you've if you had a look at what happened in in cape town but it got quite dire at one stage um any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't looked um, closely with South Africa, but I remember when it um, happened and how dire it was. They had similar in California a couple of years ago, where mm. it literally almost went down to bare earth in in mm. some of the um, takes. We, we, from an infrastructure wise, we we're okay. We're we're taking um, from another dam. We've got some bore water um, infrastructure. We are tapping into um but it's also we we i guess we ought to have long, longer periods of drought um with climate change but this year is particularly bad they would say being a one in 100 yeah. year but i've even heard mention that this could be a one in 500 year 
kind of drought situation. So you can't always build your infrastructure for the worst of times. Otherwise we'd sort of bankrupt uh, the city. And yeah. We don't have yeah. any more dam space um, really. There's been two looked at over time, but there isn't really any more valleys um, outside the Waitakere and Hunua ranges that you um, could do it. And we have um, had a consent in with the Waikato Regional Council for seven years waiting for an increased water take. So the government is getting involved in that and hopefully um, that will be addressed quite soon. But the water saving what message is an important one anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts, because we're surrounded by so much water, desalination um, plants and that sort of equipment? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so a lot of people talk about desalination and it's, I mean, I guess the biggest examples are in Dubai and other places where there isn't yeah. actually any other water um, source that they can take from. Um, yeah. For a New Zealand perspective, the, the finance or the business case just doesn't really... Um, work out it's very expensive there is a, a energy wise it's it's not great great for the climate either but also you'd basically have to take a whole coastline or a whole beach area whole bay um, completely away so the the environmental impacts would probably be too high so mm. it's got to be you've got to have the whole like pipe system and factory kind of water system all across like a whole beach um, so I don't think we would want to see, yeah, if you just Google the other examples around the world, that's not, it's not pretty, but it's also pretty damaging to all the sea life and the yeah, shorebird, shorebirds yeah. and everything. Um, but it's also, it, because everything is funded, um, the water care dollars, uh, bills we pay, they can't make a profit. They can only take what they need to operate and build um, our current infrastructure. So if we were building something extremely expensive like that, our water care bills would probably double before we even had extra um, water. Yeah, so it just, yeah. from a New Zealand perspective, it's not, and in somewhere like Dubai and other places, it kind of makes sense because it's probably the only water um, they can Source. use. I know like yeah. even in like Antarctica, they, they do it as well at Scott Base, um, but that's on a very small scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to um, sort of get personal now. How, how are you um, and your partner managing through this whole uh, period? What, what are you doing to stay fit, healthy, sane and productive? Yeah, I mean, I, in some respects, the first couple of weeks were kind of overwhelming with work and with the contact I was getting, um, just trying to help people hook into the wage subsidy or deal with uh, local issues. And it was, I was just receiving tons. So I was kind of overwhelmed for those first two weeks of lockdown, just trying to support the community. Um, so that was pretty intense. But apart since then, like really lockdown um, has been quite fine. Obviously I'm missing family and friends, but we've been doing sort of six to 12 K day um, walks around our um, oh, wow little neighborhood and just you know i normally just don't have the time because i'm out at events or meetings at night so we've been doing walks at night cooking food at home which a lot of the time i don't get time for either with the job so there are some definite um things that have uh, i guess it's hard to say positive because it's it's such a um lockdown has been so tough on so many but i guess there are things that you can look at that i need to make sure that i um keep doing when we get back to normal. So making time for that exercise, making time to spend with others, ringing friends uh, or video calling friends that you don't talk to normally just because you've got the time. So I think it's about making sure I continue the job that I do, but yeah. um, making time for the things that are important in your personal life as well. Because uh, I guess what lockdown has made me realize is there's a balance. You have to balance um, yeah. work and life instead of making like your life work your work. life yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah totally um obviously you know we're, from a shout and co standpoint uh, and this sort of communication platform you know in good company and thank you for your good company by the way we 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 want to champion you know the small to medium size uh, business which accounts for as you know 97 percent of you know the 
New Zealand economy. What are your What are your thoughts? Um, what if you have a message uh, message to uh, the SME out there at the moment? Uh, obviously, the government of the day has done, in my mind, um, tremendously to free up uh, capital, at least funds to to tide uh, people over, which I think has been well received. Um, do you have any thoughts, words of wisdom, um, or anything that that's sort of that the government's working on uh, at the moment to to give the listener, the viewer, um, who is an SME or in an SME, uh, a sense of um, certainty and comfort in a time where there's not much of it. Yeah, I mean, definitely from, I think the government's done amazing with the wage subsidy and things like that. I mean, getting it out so fast within a couple mm. of days to people um, really gave um, businesses that confidence and the ability to keep staff on. I think in Australia, that has only started coming in in the last week, um, which has really been shown why their um, unemployment benefits are skyrocketing compared to ours. But the government does need to act. Now again, what, what is the next phase? People need to know um, how they can get su support uh, urgently um, to keep their businesses afloat. I don't think it's perfect right now. I think there's a lot of worried people. So um, from a council perspective, it's hard. We can't borrow like the government. So for us, we're trying to keep projects afloat. We're trying to focus. My focus has been trying to save projects and keep projects going that are on in town centres and around our local villages instead of maybe the big greenfield, um, you know, urban sprawl projects yeah. like mm. some of that stuff that's in new subdivisions. We're probably not going to have, um, you know, immigration for quite a while. We're not going to have the growth we have. So how about we focus on our current communities um, until we wait for that sort of market to pick up again. But I, you know, yeah. I think what I've seen um, small businesses really band together. Um, I think that's yeah. what is going to show that people, um, I think people will survive through this if they are able to change the way they, they work quickly, um, be flexible. It might be their other shops in their town centers or the shops in their mall. How can they buy each other's product? How can we mm. support local? Um, that whole circular kind of economy as yeah. such, you know, I'll use your design work if you buy my product and I can take that um, local brewery's beer on for my restaurant now. Um, and that, even though it's a little bit more expensive, I'm helping them and they can help me. And so I, I, I think we're already yeah. seeing that everywhere. People just suddenly changing um, the way they, they normally operate. Um, to protect each other because the more people we have in work, the more people, businesses that survive, the more help each other. So with people yeah. and, and encouraging people who do have money or aren't as affected, you know, spending locally, really yeah. trying to, if you're planning on, if you've saved a lot of money to renovate and you've still got a full, you've had full-time work through lockdown, maybe this is the time that you get some local work done on your house or, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the worst thing that could be done right now is everyone with money holds it back and they yeah. freak out about it um, and everything retracts and then suddenly there's no money going back to the economy and we won't all be able to focus on the government um, subsidies forever because they're meant to what the government can do as well. So mm -hmm. I'm sure every business is thinking that and doing that but um, I think it's up to all of us to support um, our local businesses, promote their yeah. stuff, you know, if you've got family and friends with businesses, how are you helping them? Um, you know, it's all, it's really looking wider than our own um, households or ourselves or our usual yeah, kind of yeah. ways of working. I think you're right. You know, it's, it's certainly um, a behavioral change to how we engage local markets. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen so many people support their local cafe, uh, obviously yeah. responsibly during this time. And uh, I think it, it talks to one, people have missed caffeine. <laughs> yeah. So that's the first thing. <laughs> um, two, I think people also have just missed seeing other people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so even if it is you know, at a two meter distance, I think there's a knowing uh, between humans to say, hey, you know, we're in this together and uh, you know, good on you for getting out there and supporting the local business. So. Um, if you're a local business owner and you're watching or if you're watching this later, um, yeah, continue to do what you do in the way that you do it and share the love and you know, hopefully we'll come out on the other side of this. I think from a brand New Zealand perspective, Rich, um, 
and I've like yourself, I've got mates all around the world. I'm getting random texts and messages and stuff from people saying New Zealand looked like they're killing this um, uh, you know, pandemic. And, and I yep. literally use that word uh, and it's um, um, sort of double meaning um, uh, purposefully because like people are looking at Cindy Ardern and what she's doing with the government and stuff like put it, they're shining a light on how governments can and ought to operate. Do you have any thoughts on, on that and sort of the, the, the Kiwi approach to this whole thing? Yeah, definitely. I, I don't think if, if we didn't have good support and understanding behind the Prime Minister, I don't think people would have um, come together as a community as we have. So you need, there's a high level of trust. You can put laws in place, but if you um, don't trust the leader or the, or the messenger, um, you don't get the wide um, taken like we have. Um, so I think that, that having those messages, the really key ones, even the sneaky ones that she, maybe the Prime Minister didn't think of at first, like a bubble, you know, it was such an obvious thing, but all of us took up that um, kind yeah. of Hashtag approach. Hashtag bubble, it's just been like, yeah. it's just spread, you know? The, and the levels, and I think people say, a lot of people say maybe we should have gone earlier, but you, I just think you had to have the community buy-in, the understanding moving forward. If if two weeks earlier, the prime minister had said, hey, tomorrow we're locking down, none of you are going to work, probably people would have laughed um, or not really understood. But when you saw those numbers uh, jump up um, and there was a real acknowledgement that, oh, this is, this is looking uh, really problematic, then I think that, um, yeah, that was probably the bit or the time that, people really realize what was going on and um and yeah it, it, it's all about messaging but also i think the the other thing people are missing that if if you try and save the economy by not saving the um the health people, of the economy, the economy. Yeah. you don't yeah. actually you don't have actually, an economy <laughs> yeah you don't have the economy without the people yeah. and other yeah. areas yeah. like sweden and singapore and others that have tried their best to um, save the economy first and not lock down have ended up having really poor um, health outcomes and then now they're starting to see the impacts on the economy as well so hopefully if we um, see the fact that we've saved our health um, that it will also bring the economy to us so people AT, our uh, economic development agency are already talking about people from all overseas wanting to invest here first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's amazing. Event, event holders are thinking of, you know, bringing worldwide events here, even without stadiums, if it's safe to have, um, if they're going to quarantine here for 14 days, you can get things off the ground. Um, the film industry, a whole lot of um, people figuring out, okay, if we, if America or other places are pretty hamstrung at the moment with the health situation, that we can start up in somewhere like New Zealand and be safe and, so, you know, having that lockdown and having saving the health of our people will have really big economic uh, benefits in the short to medium yeah. term, but even, even long term, if people know their investment is safe and secure because the people are safe and secure, then mm -hmm. I think that benefits us all. I think, you, I think you hit the nail on the head and it comes down to, and that's the reason I wanted to speak to you is because the level of communication that I see coming out of uh, I guess your platforms as well as um, the current government of the day is, is truly remarkable, you know, uh, and it, I think it gives people confidence. Another thing that I see happening, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is an element of nation building. You know, when a collective goes through something traumatic together, um, sort of the coming out of that on the other side, we've all got a story to tell. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I saw that happen you know, I was still a youngster at the time, but um, a great example of that is the Rainbow Nation in South Africa and what happened, you know, post-apartheid, Nelson Mandela, da -da -da -da, the ANC government. And, you know, um, there was this coming together of, of all people uh, to move forward together. Do you think that this could also be seen as a form of nation building? Uh, there, there will be some of that, definitely. Uh, I think, and I think, I kind of expected that more from the Christchurch um, terrorist attack last year, but uh, I think for some people that really stuck, but for others, um, I think the world moves so fast these days that it kind of ebbs and flows. Like you just kind of 
go back to normal. I don't know if this situation, um, there'll be lots of positives that bring, have brought the nation together, the, the sort of team of 5 million, um, mm. that whole suggestion, but it's, there is going to be a point, and I think it's going to get pretty tough that people do start to, there's a potential for people to start fall apart a bit and, and focus on the toughness of it all. But I, I guess there will be, um, there is that nation building thing already on that sort of buy local, support your uh, mm. family. At a community level, I think people are really reaching out to each other more than ever before. You can see it in the streets. People are more likely to talk to each other, um, mm. say hello at the shops, they've shared. Um, everyone's got the shared story now. Everyone feels comfortable to talk yeah. about what's happening because it's happening to everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think maybe short term, medium term, there is a kind of togetherness that, um, but I think we're pretty close anyway, as a country, we don't get mm. overly divided, like many other countries, even our politics. Um, you know, we're pretty together anyway. So we just have to yeah. kind of maintain that and, and build on what we've already got. But whether it lasts forever, um, I don't know. I'm hoping that there are some really good opportunities and positive things that come out of this that do stick with us. I think it is probably going to be one of those things that people share forever. Like I have my nephew who was born um, during this time, you know, he'll always... I saw that. Yeah, I saw that yeah. post. Where you he'll always to be told. The window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He'll always be it's told, cute, like, man. you were born during, during the pandemic and here's pictures of you and, you know, that kind of thing. So I guess there is that kind of collective knowledge that something kind of out of the ordinary happened yeah um, and it affected everyone at the same time rich look i can talk a hind leg of a donkey i know that you're a busy man um i'm, I'm gonna wrap <laughs> it up here and so i just wanted Good. to give you an opportunity to share any last words to the community at large um yeah the floor's yours go go ahead i mean i get it's just the same messages that um everyone's been bringing i guess just stick together um try and be positive through this if you can't you know really reach out to your friends and family um text or call the 1737 number um you know to get that helpline help um it's good it is going to be tough there are some really positive things coming out of it but actually getting back to normal is going to be pretty what that normal looks like so i guess more now than ever that we have to be supporting each other but also being not afraid to uh, speak out and say, you know, how tough it might be or what issues you might be having with your business or your family. Um, Cause you know, this will be a big dip. It may be a year, maybe two that we get back to normal, but we will get out of this. It's just how we get out of it. That is um, key. So, you know, be kind to each other. Um, you know, don't get too stressed out if things don't go our way. A lot of businesses are going to be frustrated with the level two rules. I'm sure but but it is about making sure we don't go backwards and we don't end up like some of the other countries who are in pretty um, dire state. Um, state of play over there is not, is, is not good. So let's try and build on the good things and the positive things that we've got through this. Because um, if you think back to five weeks ago, I think we were all pretty anxious and scared about oh, yeah. the health outcomes. And we have lost um, 21 people and a lot of people will be affected by um, the virus itself in New Zealand, but nothing like what we've seen overseas. And we need to, I guess, focus on that and move forward um, and try and make the hurt that people will be feeling as minimized as possible. And let's hope that the government and other agencies um, back everyone up on that too. Yeah. Well, Richard, I cannot thank you enough for your time, uh, for being, uh, for your good company uh, here <laughs> no on the Co uh, platform. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, your communications uh, continued comms uh, from here on out and hopefully glean some insights uh, from how you communicate and apply those, dare I say, to our business and, and the brands that we serve uh, in and around um, Auckland and New Zealand at large. So thank you for your time. Thank you for yeah, your money. So Thank you for everything. And um, yeah, man, I probably won't see you in person, but we'll probably see you online. So thank yeah. you. And to everyone who watched and joined, thank you. Thank you for your likes. I've been seeing them come up. So yeah, uh, hopefully uh, in level two, we'll have some normality and get to level one and then eventually get to normal sooner rather than later. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank see you. See you later. Have a good rest of your day. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.